What's up, outliers? Today, we're going to talk about trading meme stocks with options. The whole goal of this video is to hopefully change the way we think about using options, because I know for a lot of traders, they think it's kind of fast, easy money to get leverage. But the problem is, is most of us are structuring trades probably the exact wrong way. So what I'm guessing is the majority of you that have tried this have probably bought some sort of fairly near term dated option that's pretty far out of the money and you kind of just watch your money evaporate in front of your eyes. So the goal is to not do that. So let's dive straight in and get into the details. So First off, I'm gonna give you some general concepts to keep in mind about trading directionally with options. And then we'll get into the specifics about meme stocks as an example. So when we're trading directionally with options, there's a few things that need to be nailed down before we even start. The first one is the profit mechanism. So a lot of people will start just picking different option structures, not paying attention to the fact that if you pick the wrong option structure, then you, know, you may or may not make money it's hard to tell. But what I can guarantee you is that if you don't have a defined profit mechanism, doesn't matter what option structure you pick, you won't make money. So we have to figure out how things make money first. And here are a couple examples. So we have things like price movement, changes in volatility, yields if something pays a dividend, if there's correlations, so on and so forth. So when we're talking about meme stocks, there's some very specific traits that come with them. But the main thing that we're trading when we're looking at stuff like meme stocks is actually these two right here, price, movement, and volatility, which we'll talk more about. So once we understand the profit mechanisms, we need to measure them. We need to understand how they work. What are the ins and outs of when it happens, which I have a prime example for you that we're going to get into looking at five different meme stocks from GameStop, Cost, Siri, Lunar, to give you some ideas on how to look at this. But we need to not just understand the profit mechanism, but we need to measure it it and then figure out corresponding signals that help us find it. Now we get to use options. We get to look at what structures make the most sense for what we're trying to accomplish. Because as you'll note, when we go through an example in a minute, there are trade-offs to every single options structure. And that's the beautiful part is you get a chance to fit things so that it makes sense based on your specific thesis. So if we have things that are expected to move a whole bunch, well, we probably don't want to sell premium because then we're going to miss out on a lot of profit. You'll learn more about that in a moment. The last thing is to tie all of this together. So now we understand the profit mechanism. We've measured it. We know how it behaves. We've identified signals that help us find it. We've compared different structures and we understand what structures make the most sense based on how this thing moves and our ability to detect it. So now we codify what we're doing so that we can continually do it over time consistently. And that allows us to optimize our approach and ultimately make more money, which is the name of the game. So if we think about this process, it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. And we'll look at an example together. So we're going to start by looking at a profit mechanism. Then we're going to start figuring out what strategy makes the most sense. I follow kind of a three-step process where I'm going to look at what is my general thoughts towards the economy, the market, that kind of stuff. Look at the portfolio, see if there's any specific needs, and then the position itself. Then I'm going to build a trade. And for this example, we're actually going to look at meme stocks. So let's start with what we just talked about. What's the profit? Profit mechanism. Well, the profit mechanism here, as I've already outlined, is going to be price movement up or down and volatility changes up or down. So then what are some of the traits that we can think of when we look at meme stocks? Well, let's eyeball it really fast. If we hop over to the platform, you'll see a few things right out of the gate. So I'm right now looking at GameStop. One of the things I notice about the profit mechanisms here is that they're pretty severe. All that means is I can find plenty of periods of time where things are kind of really, really quick quiet. And then all of a sudden they get really not quiet. That's very, very important to identify. And again, if I look at something like Siri, I see the same thing. It'll go through periods of time where it trends a little bit, trends again, then takes another trend. And then it'll go through these explosive periods up or down. So 
what I'm doing here is identifying the traits of this profit mechanism. So I can obviously see that it's very high volatility and I can see that it moves very quickly. Now, this is just an eyeball test. I'm looking at the charts, coming up with some ideas, and you'll see in a second that we can get one click into detail and actually qualify and quantify both profit mechanism behavior and then signals. Because again, signals are how do we determine when this stuff starts to happen? So again, when I look through this and just eyeball it, there's one thing I can tell you clear as day. When I see price starting to go crazy, I see volume go crazy across the board in every single circumstance. So here we can see price is kind of like trending, but notice how volume, although comparatively to here, it looks way less it still is much higher than what it was in here. So that gives me some ideas on what might matter. I also can see clear relationships between prices relationship to moving averages or even things like oscillators. So then what I do is I take those ideas and I say, okay, well, let me take a look at some different indicators and let me find a correlation between certain size price moves and what that indicator is showing me. And in this case, you can see a bunch of different indicators, but what jumps out at me is that the five day average volume across all of these different stocks, which is this red line here, is highly, highly correlated with price movement of greater than 10%. So then that gives me one thing I need to pay attention to. Okay, I now know average volume in relation to current volume is actually pretty informative. I can also tell you something using like an RSI with a five day moving average is not very correlated. So that might be one I spend less time focusing on and I spend more time focusing on these other tools. Volume is a massive, massive indicator. So then I also want to qualify and quantify those movements I was talking about. Okay, so now if I see any of these stocks move greater than 15%, once it moves 15%, how much higher above it does it typically go? And we can see that in these bars for cost, series, SoFi, Lunar, and GME. Then I can also say, okay, how long does it stay above that threshold? That's what the red line is. And I can tell you that it's really short duration for most of them after those moves. So all of this information directly feeds into how I think about building positions, which we're going to get into right now. So I can tell you in terms of timing that there are two different elements to this. One, if I'm trying to time it really, really well and catch the majority of the move, I'm going to have to have some sort of longer term position in here because by the time you start to see volume expanding, it's already starting its move. Now, my preference is actually to follow the latter part of the move more than anything. But if you're trying to capture the whole move, you have to be very thoughtful about what duration you choose to pick. So for something like GameStop right now, as if I was trying to trade some sort of what I expect to be upward movement, well, it's really quiet. There's nothing for me to do right now. So I'm probably gonna favor a mix of long-term and short-term durations so that the long-term can keep me exposed if the thing happens before I can pick up on it. But then when I start to see some of these signals occurring, then maybe I can add some short-term trades as well to capitalize on the movement when they start to move. The other thing I can tell you is that I have a bunch of other visuals here, but the overall move severity, meaning how far it tends to move, the vast majority of the case, it's not much. But then sometimes it will have a smaller subset of these really big parabolic moves. So then it tells me the majority of the time I'm going to be playing it, it's actually for less than these massive moves that we might see. And then that tells me that every once in a while, I'll see a really big move. So then that leads me to a few strategies that I think make the most sense. Trading it to the upside, I'm probably going to use something like ratio call diagonals or just regular diagonals. And I would add kicker options. I have a video that I'll link to in the notes below that goes through this more in detail. We'll look at a quick model together. And then the way that I can trade it to the downside, because I know that it doesn't stay above the threshold for that long is by trading something like long puts. So why do I favor long premium strategies? Because as we've talked about, I want the structure to fit the thesis. And if I'm talking about things that are moving a lot, I actually don't want to have capped profit potential so I can capture those moves when they happen. The other thing is if I'm trading some sort of short premium against it, it can be really painful to go through these really big moves and it can be problematic. So let's talk about this idea of building these trades now. So when I'm going through and I'm deciding, let's just start with ratio call diagonals. This is a really simple structure. Essentially, what I'm going to do is select 
the product that I want to trade. And then I'm going to figure out where I think it might go to. Some of us might think it's MOAS. Some of us might think it could be another run up above 45, whatever your profit target is. Then I'm going to start modeling trades off of that. The important part of defining a profit target is so that you don't do this, where let's say we get in when GameStop is down here at 10 bucks, it goes up to 64 and then it comes back down and then we're just still in it. Not saying get out, not saying completely move away. But what I am saying is that if you do this, you showed a massive profit that then went away. And again, if it's some sort of long-term buy and hold trade for you, that's a completely different strategy. This is talking about trading these movements. So you need a way to get out when it's at a favorable price or even reverse the position to take it to the other side. So what I tend to do is look at a few different choices, but the very first thing we have to decide on when buying call options is how far out in time do we want to go? Because if you are too close in time, they to decay is very, very high. So I try to balance a few things because if you'll notice the theta decay curve here, it really starts to accelerate once we get within 30 days to expiration. I don't necessarily want that. The other problem is gamma. Gamma is the rate of change of delta. And if we're buying options, we want gamma. It's how our options start to compound. So the way that I think about it is if I want to maintain a position in GameStop, I'm going to use options that are slightly further out in time. I'm going to use options that are actually slightly in the money. Why do I do this? Because they have a higher delta, so they're going to move better dollar for dollar with the underlying. These are going to be more expensive. So I have to account for that upfront, but I can always add what I like to call kicker options, which would be combining it if movement starts to happen. So let's say I establish that position now because I think it's at an overall good price level, right? Then if it starts to show volume exceeding the five day average and it's starting to look bullish, well, then in that case, I can come back in and I could say, well, maybe I'll go out like 30 days or 20 days and then I'll pick up some options that are maybe like a 30 delta, something like that. Now, what's the problem with just grabbing these? They're way cheaper. They look awesome. There's a problem. Notice how high the theta decay is. It's three cents, which might not sound like a ton, $3, but as a percentage of the remaining premium, it's actually quite massive. So this is why if we take a look at an example here, this is looking at that one single in the money option. And let's say we get that move up to 45 up here. If we get that, we make 2,200 bucks. Not bad. We're putting up $480 to make that. That's great. We would make way more money if we buy the 27 September 21 and a half calls. So slightly out of the money for 49 cents because they're so cheap. We essentially can get 10 of those for the price we get one of the other ones. And then if we get that move to 45, well, now we make $23,000. That sounds pretty damn good, doesn't it? But again, there's a problem. Here's the problem. Watch as I fast forward time just a little bit. If I go forward, let's say to the 25th, of September. Notice what happens to my options. They essentially start decaying away to nothing. And then they have to have a much bigger move in order to make the same amount of money. And then as we talked about before, there's an overwhelming probability of instances where we don't actually get the big move. So then if you continue buying these cheap out of the money options, you're going to cycle through them repeatedly until hopefully sooner or later it hits. But how much will have been lost in that process, which is exactly why I prefer to trade something like this. It doesn't make as much money, but it doesn't lose anywhere near as much money as time passes. And I make more money off of smaller moves that allow me to slowly build my account versus eroding it. And then when I see interesting conditions, I can add those kicker options. So the way to think about picking an expiration is the more time you give yourself, the better off you're going to be in terms of letting the trade work but it's going to be more expensive. The other thing you do is when you go further out in time, you might be incentivized or think it's better. Well, maybe I'll go further out in time, but get these cheap options. Well, the problem with the cheap options is they will have lower gamma being further out in time. So if I show you gamma, this is showing you two different expirations. This is showing you 10 DTE versus 30 DTE. And if you go to like 60, it's even further down here. So the problem is if gamma is too low and you have a low delta. So let's take a look at these 34s, for example, if GameStop 
stop goes up by a dollar, my options will appreciate by 30 cents, and then my delta will gain by three, so this will go from 30 to 33. It's not bad, but compare that to these 18s that I was modeling in the other trade. In this case, if GameStop goes up by a dollar, the premium will change by 70 cents or $70, and then I'll gain four gamma. So I'll get a little bit more gamma, and on a dollar for dollar move, I'll make more, but here's the trade-off. It's more money upfront. Your money is not going to compound as much. Compare that to the inverse. If you buy further out of the money options, no matter if it's close or far, they're going to decay more quickly. And if it's a lower delta and further out in time, they're less sensitive to price movements. So then you stand to make less overall. This is the beauty of trading options. And for me, the answer for something like this is pretty simple. I would essentially structure long calls via something further out in time. I would probably sell some near-term short calls calls against it to help subsidize the cost. And I would do it at a ratio. This is what makes it a ratio call diagonal. So for example, if I add these calls against my longs, but instead of just having one, let's say I put on five of them and then I sell two calls against it. So now I have a leveraged long position. I'm collecting some theta from these short calls. And then when the move eventually starts to happen, then I can come in closer in time again, maybe this 2431 DTE, and then add some kicker options that are further out of the money, higher probability of losing the investment. But if I do get the move, then they make a bunch of money. Make sure you have a system to capture it. Because again, it doesn't do you any good to hold options that are decaying assets, have them show a really great profit, and then watch the profit go away. Not saying you have to book a full win every single time. There is an entire world around managing partial parts of your trade, setting stop losses, but the name of the game is to do something. And if we're interested in learning more about that, let me know. We can do a follow-on video. Now, the last thing that we have to cover is how do we manage the downside? Because options are decaying assets. So for me, I typically will set price levels that if something starts dropping below them, then I will either start paring my position down or I'll flatten it entirely and just say I'm directionally wrong. If you are using longer term options, you can give yourself a much wider window, but sooner or later, you have to do something with the options because otherwise they will decay away into nothing. So taking them all the way to expiration typically is not a great idea. So the simplest approach for me, like I said, is literally just setting alerts like this. And if I get alert to the upside or the downside, then I'll move a stop up and continue to track the profits like that. And if it's on the loss side, I'll set a defined period that I will get out. And then if it starts going back up, I'll get right back in. But what I don't want to do is hold the asset as it's decaying because then it makes it more and more difficult to make money. Until next time, be an outlier. I'll see you all later.